the mind settle down in the present. And sometimes you can use the word let, let the mind do this. Other times you have to force it. Because there are times when the mind is not willing to settle down. It's got all kinds of other issues to think about, all other kinds of other agendas. And now it's got a whole hour where it can think about those things. Things that were suppressed in the course of the day because there were other things that captured your attention suddenly can start popping up to the surface. And you have to have the tools needed to keep them from getting in the way. And sometimes the tool is just simply the desire to be still. For example, when the mind is tired, it really wants to rest. In cases like that, all you have to do is give it a good resting spot, and your main concern then is to make sure it doesn't fall asleep, or doesn't drift off into a zone where it's not really aware of what's going on. If the body's tired, okay, do some good deep in and out breathing. to make sure there's enough oxygen in the brain, and then gradually allow the breathing to settle down to a more comfortable rate. Once it's comfortable, okay, spread that sense of comfort to fill the whole body, and then try to be very consciously aware of the whole body. Don't let your awareness shrink. However, there are times when the mind has more energy to think, and that way you've got to cut it off in other ways, partly by explaining things to it. Having values that will cut off the thoughts. All too often our values go in the other direction, encourage thinking, especially the idea that we have that if we figure things out beforehand, then we don't have to do the work. So many of us come to the meditation with that attitude. If you read enough books, if you think things through, reason things through, then you won't have to do all the work. You just settle down and insights will pop into the mind and the job is done. It doesn't work that way. Because a lot of the insights that we're trying to get are into the way the mind functions. And you can't really see the functioning of the mind until you wrestle with it, to know its ins and outs, to know where the, the tricks it plays on itself are coming from. And you have to have some good retorts. Sometimes there's an, a conversation or an argument that goes on in the mind. Part of the mind wants to think about this, think about that. Well, you've got to argue with it. Give good reasons for not going there. Remind yourself that knowledge isn't something, at least the knowledge we're looking for in the meditation, isn't something that comes from thinking things through. And John Sawat had a good line on this. He said, it's like darkness. If we don't like the darkness, you can't scratch a hole in it. You can't snatch it. You can't tear it. You have to light a light. The light will take care of the darkness. But all the other things we do to try to grab hold of the darkness and rip it away just don't work. It's the same with the mind, he said. We can't think our way out of ignorance. You have to watch so you can give rise to discernment. The discernment here is precisely that, the awareness that comes when you really watch things carefully, when you observe what's going on in the mind. And so you have to set up the right circumstances. Again, it's not a matter of thinking things through. The proper preparation for the meditation, the part that explains it beforehand, simply tells you how to set up the right situation, and then you just simply have to watch. A good analogy is with a hunter. The hunter does what he can to prepare to go out hunting get all of his weapons in the right order. And then you go out and you have to sit very still, and the hunter can't decide beforehand, well, the rabbit's going to come along at 2 p.m. so we can come back at 3 and have dinner at the proper time. The hunter goes out and all the hunter can do is sit there very quietly, and yet at the same time be very watchful.
And then whether the rabbit comes at noon or two or four, or if it doesn't come that day, the hunter still has to be very watchful all the time. Can't let his attention slip, can't make a noise. And it's nothing that he can figure out beforehand. Can't, through the force of his will, make the rabbit come at a particular time or in a particular place. The hunter just does the best that he can and then watches. And it's the same with the meditation. You get the mind as still as you can, and then you have to watch if you're going to get any really new insights into what's going on. Actually, as meditators, we're better off than hunters because the mind is constantly sending out little signals. It's constantly dealing with this, dealing with that, making this choice, making that choice. The problem is we're not still enough. We're not attentive enough. We don't focus our attention in the right places. We don't ask the right questions. And as a result, we don't see, even though it's happening right there before our eyes. So we have to be very, very careful, very, very still. And then ask the right questions. The Buddha gives instructions on this. They're questions that surround the Four Noble Truths. Where is their stress? Where is their craving? When is mindfulness present? When is it absent? Can you see these things? When it's present, how can you keep it going? When it's absent, how can you give rise to it? These are the questions he asks, ask about the present moment. Aside from that, just put everything else aside, all your other concerns, all the other distractions that come along. And focus on the real issue at hand, which is how to deal with suffering, how to deal with stress. For once that issue is dealt with, there's, everything is taken care of. got a letter recently from a doctor who was claiming that Modern psychology has an advance over Buddhism, because Buddhism deals only with the problem of suffering. But modern psychology deals with suffering, and it also gives meaning to life. I think he understands the depth of the problem of suffering. Once you really eradicate suffering, okay, what remains to your life, the meaning of what you want to do, okay, it's very clear. And it will vary from person to person. But the big issue that everybody has is, digging out the roots of suffering. Once those roots are dug out, then the question of meaning is not really a problem. Why does the question of meaning bother us? Okay, there must be some suffering, there must be some stress surrounding it. We look into it. Why does there have to be, why does there have to be a meaning to things? What's the suffering that comes from there not being a meaning? Dig into it, look into it. If that's too abstract or too subtle, we'll focus on where you do see the suffering, where you do see the craving. Because developing our powers of observation is a process just like anything else. You work from the, the crude to the subtle, from the gross to the refined. You don't sit there and say, well, this issue is too crude for me. I'm going to wait till the subtle ones come. You have to handle the crude ones first. You have to handle the blatant issues first. Get practice with them, and then your sensitivity, your awareness gets more and more subtle. You have to start where you are, then accept where you are as your starting place. You can't say, well, I wish my concentration were better, I wish it's the way it was the way it was that years ago. You have to put those issues aside and say, well, where is it right now? What are my abilities right now? What issues present themselves right now? If you get used to handling what's here right now, you're focused on the right spot. You're developing the habits you need. Because after all, this is a skill we're working on. It's not an intellectual puzzle where you can just 
think things through. Skills re require dedication. They require time. They require commitment. There's an interesting story they tell about choosing candidates for the surgery program at UC San, San Francisco. And you have to figure everybody who applies to be a brain surgeon at UC San Francisco has got to be pretty smart. But not everybody who's smart is going to succeed in the program. So the question is how to weed out the people who are not going to succeed. And they found that one of the most effective questions, one of the most useful questions to ask the applicants is, could you tell me about a recent mistake you made? And as for the candidates who say, well, I can't think of any mistakes I made recently, those are immediately crossed out. Whereas the ones who say, oh yeah, just the other day I made this, this mistake. And then they say, well, how did you handle it? And they say, well, I tried this and I tried that and finally this worked, or maybe it didn't work, but I'm still working on it. Those are the ones who are accepted into the school. It's not the people who have everything figured out all beforehand are going to succeed. It's the ones who keep learning all along the way. And the same principle applies to meditation. You have to learn to put your mind in a learning mood all the time. Because it's only then that you'll see the things that you didn't see before. That will light the light that drives away the darkness of ignorance. So keep on watching. <laughs>